So we know the greenhouse effect is the driver of climate change. As we think about you know, what's driving the greenhouse effect, uh, I think it's important that we just quickly uh, familiarize ourselves with what's driving uh, the greenhouse effect. And that is that as solar insulation hits uh, the planet's surface, much of it is reflected back uh, off into the atmosphere by the Earth, although a significant uh, portion of it is actually absorbed by um, molecules within the atmosphere of uh, Earth. And of course, as uh, the molecules that do that absorbing increase in their concentrations in the atmosphere of Earth, then they are increasing their radiative forcing. That is, they are uh, um, absorbing more and more of that energy before it gets reflected back out into space. And so we have this uh, so-called greenhouse effect as uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases accumulate uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, when we look at the results of the greenhouse effect, we see a very clear signal in uh, temperature changes. And so here's a, uh, a very odd uh, x-axis that has the number of years before present on a quasi-log scale. It's sort of a contrived scale. Uh, but the importance isn't so much the scale as the degree of change that we've seen in temperature uh, over these periods of time. And you can see as we came out of the end of the last ice age some 10,000 years ago when agriculture uh, emerged, um, there really has been a re relatively little change in uh, temperature until um, right about now. And as you can see, we see this increase, uh, rapid increase in temperatures uh, that um, start around 1970 um, and um, can be related to the increase in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. When we look at uh, these same types of data on a shorter time scale since the Industrial Revolution, which we see here in the 1850, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the origin here on the, this x-axis, again, we're looking at average uh, temperature of the Earth's surface. As we get to the year 2000, we can see these projections that are similar to those RCP estimates that we saw in a previous video, where we look at concentrations um, maybe plateauing a bit if we get really aggressive about reducing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, but I guess the trajectory we're on now is probably somewhere between what's considered the central estimate and the high estimate of uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And the, these are the types of temperature increases that we're likely to see under those scenarios. So when we talk about greenhouse gases, there's a list of them. The three that we tend to um, talk about the most because they're the ones that are related to agriculture are CO2, carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O. Uh, these other uh, chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, per perfluoromethane uh, are related to industrial processes. Um, CO2, of course, as we've talked about, is respired by plants and microbes and all organisms essentially on our surface. Methane uh, tends to be produced uh, from in anaerobic environments, and so anaerobic environments include wetlands, but they also include the uh, uh, stomachs of ruminants, and so we get a significant amount of methane produced by um, ruminant livestock, in particular cattle, and so methane that is uh, sometimes called enteric fermentation comes out of in their burps mainly, uh, not their farts as often is depicted in um, uh, popular media. I mean, there is some methane in their farts, but most of the methane that's emitting, emitted from livestock uh, is uh, via their burping as they ruminate and uh, on, their, on their feed. And then nitrous oxide is a gas that is emitted from soils and uh, needs anaerobic to um, slightly anoxic conditions in order to be, to be created in the soil. Um, but critically uh, is the result of high inputs of nitrogen to the soil, especially when it comes in in an inorganic form, and especially when it comes in uh, as inorganic fertilizer. And so nitrous oxide emissions from soils uh, in agricultural and agricultural settings are largely coming from um, uh, agricultural systems that are being heavily fertilized. Before we move on, I just want to point out that we have pre-industrial concentrations here indicated of these uh, gases, uh, the concentrations in 1998, this is an older table, and then the rate of concentration change. But importantly here uh, is this atmospheric lifetime uh, business that's indicated on the last row. And you can see here the uh, lifetime of a molecule of methane is shorter than the lifetime of a molecule of N2O. Likewise, when they're in the atmosphere, these uh, molecules are, um, uh, have a stronger or weaker amount uh, ability to actually absorb the uh, energy from the sun. And so um, we often talk about CO2 equivalents 
we put everything on a basis of CO2 and then relate methane and nitrous oxide on a CO2 equivalent basis, indicating that um, you know, uh, uh, one molecule of methane has a stronger radiative forcing effect than CO2. In fact, uh, some 25 to 28 times the uh, radi radiative forcing effect of CO2. And nitrous oxide has some uh, uh, 100 to 125 times uh, the uh, radiative forcing effect of CO2. And so when we put everything on a CO2 equivalent basis, that allows us to just look at the overall uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, eff uh, emissions scenario from these three uh, particular species of greenhouse gas. We look at total U.S. emissions, and this is in the year 2018, and these data come from the USDA's Economic Research Service. We can look at, um, you know, the breakdown by sector, by uh, enterprise sector, and you see that about 10.5 percent of um, the overall U.S. emissions comes came from agriculture in 2018, and uh, these have been relatively steady numbers uh, over the last uh, few years. And so you can see here that by far uh, the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions are industry transport, and transportation. And so in the transportation sector, that's largely the combustion of fossil fuels. Similarly, in industry, there's a significant combustion of fossil fuels as well as uh, production of methane, uh, whereas most of the contribution of agriculture comes in the form of nitrous oxide emissions. So if we look at agricultural emissions globally, um, this is a pretty busy figure, but it shows uh, uh, global emissions on CO2 equivalent basis. So these are N2O methane uh, emissions, N2O from manure, N2O from the soils, as I described uh, before, uh, when we add fertilizer to the soils, they tend to emit more N2O. We get N2O emissions from the burning of biomass, uh, and then we get methane from rice production. Rice is uh, basically a wetland uh, produced um, crop, and so we get a lot of methane emissions from those soils. There's methane coming from the manure of livestock. There's methane from their enteric fermentation that I described before. And then we also get methane when we burn uh, biomass and other um, fossil fuels. So uh, let's look at the breakdown here. And the first thing we see is that this is grouped by um, developing countries of South Asia, developing countries of East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, Middle East and North Africa, the Caucasus and Central Asia, Western Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and then these um, OECD Pacific countries. So this OECD uh, designation is uh, to indicate basically countries that are quote unquote developed uh, or, or um, more advanced in their economic development. And then the OECD countries of North America that include Canada, USA, and Mexico. Okay, so now that we're oriented, uh, these two right hand panels are um, summarizing all of the developing and all the developed regions. And so what we see here is that by far uh, more emissions of greenhouse gases are coming from the developing regions and reflecting their growth in populations, uh, they're, they're increasing. Uh, whereas we have more or less stable uh, contributions from the developed regions. If we look at the breakdown then, we can see that um, uh, this most, the lion's share of contributions in developing regions are coming from N2O uh, in soils. And so again, this is attributable to largely to fertilizer use and then this lighter green, uh, that's the bigger of the green bars down here, is uh, primarily from enteric fermentation uh, or methane that is uh, emerging from livestock, uh, cattle, uh, belches, burps. If we look at um, opportunities for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from agricultural ecosystems, that is reducing, <laughs> reducing them, uh, ways that we can affect them, uh, this is a very busy table, and the takeaway message of this table is that as we look across a lot of different uh, approaches to trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it's a complex and messy situation. And so we can look at cropland management, grazing land management, organic land management, uh, sorry, management of organic soils, degraded lands, livestock management. As we look across these various uh, opportunities, uh, it's what's complicated is that uh, the effects on CO2, methane, or N2O are not always the same. In fact, they're often different. And if we look at the confidence uh, in these things, the amount of agreement and the amount of scientific evidence for them uh, is sometimes strong and sometimes weak. I should have said at the beginning that when it's indicated here as a plus or a minus, uh, that denotes that either reduction or, or removal of greenhouse gases might occur or increases might occur. Uh, I guess that's what's denoted here, uncertain or variable responses. So we really don't know 
uh, well, it's not that we don't know, it's just that we're highly uncertain, we have highly uncertain responses to um, various types of management. And so, uh, again, the takeaway is that this is a very messy situation. For instance, let's look at grazing intensity. Uh, does increasing grazing intensity uh, increase or reduce uh, CO2 emissions, methane emissions, N2O emissions? It depends is the answer. Always it depends. And uh, the amount of agreement is low and the evidence for whether it uh, increases or decreases is low. And so this really uh, represents to you the, that this is like the frontier of scientific knowledge. People are still working on this. Nonetheless, uh, there's all manner of effort to try and make changes in what we're doing in agriculture to try and reduce uh, the amount of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide uh, in the environment. So now this figure gets to what it is we're trying to do. Uh, and it, again, this is a busy figure, but there's really one main takeaway message here. Uh, if we look at uh, these yellow estimates, they're all really are, are, are accounting for uh, the amount of carbon that's fluxing into terrestrial ecosystems and the oceans on an annual basis or out of. And the units of measure here for all the numbers on this that are not in parentheses uh, is petagrams of carbon per year. The numbers in parentheses are stocks, so that's how much is there at any particular time. But for instance, uh, on, on average every year, photosynthesis accounts for about 120 petagrams of carbon per year on, in, the, in the terrestrial environment, that is on the land. Uh, and that's more or less balanced with plant respiration and microbial respiration back off to the atmosphere. And so uh, that's all fine and dandy as long as that is balanced. But we know that uh, the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is actually stimulating photosynthesis about three petagrams uh, of carbon per year. And that's a good thing because that's more MPP, more carbon potentially being accumulated in soils. And that's what we would like to do, especially in our agricultural systems, but also in our uh, so-called natural ecosystems. Now, uh, the same sort of thing's happening in the ocean where uh, photosynthesis by phytoplankton is increasing the amount of uh, uptake of carbon each year. So the uptake of carbon each year is being uh, stimulated by climate change by about five petagrams of carbon per year. But fossil fuel combustion, the creation of cement and land use change, which is largely uh, here related to what Holly Gibbs talked to us about, which is the conversion of terrestrial I'm sorry, the, the conversion of tropical forests from uh, into pastures is resulting in a loss of nine petagrams of carbon per year. And so this difference is an annual carbon increase in the atmosphere of four petagrams of carbon per year. And that's what we're trying to offset as we think about carbon sequestration. So we might ask the question, can we actually manage our cropping systems and forests uh, and our grazing lands to um, uh, address that gap of four petagrams of carbon per year. Uh, here we have uh, permafrost C indicated as uh, a loss of carbon from the terrestrial environment in tropical regions, in polar regions, where carbon that has been trapped for thousands and thousands of years is being released to the atmosphere uh, as the um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions have increased. And then this human land use business is what we talked about already, that change in um, that harvesting of tropical biomass and converting tropical forests into pastures. But um, there is hope that we can manage our forests and our crops and our grazing to help offset this. And these are the numbers that we're looking at uh, as a potential for increasing uh, carbon uptake by, by our um, terrestrial ecosystems. Now, if we look at those numbers, of pedig that's, that's a global number, petagrams per year. Uh, this assumes gains of about 10 to 70 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So this sort of gives us like a, uh, a goal as we think about managing a particular agroecosystem. And just for context, I've shown a picture here of Greg Sanford holding what looks to me to be about 20 grams of soil in his hand. About two and a half percent of that soil is soil organic carbon, so carbon. And so you can imagine in order to get these kinds of gains, let's say at the low end, 10 grams of carbon per meter squared per year, uh, if there's a half a gram of carbon in this picture, then Greg needs to spread um, uh, roughly uh, 20 handfuls of soil like this onto a meter squared area each year. Now that doesn't seem like a lot until we look at the way agroecosystems actually work. So we've talked in the past about carbon in and carbon out, plant inputs coming in, microbial outputs going out. These arrows are largely driven by climate, but management of our agroecosystems has a profound effect on the relative size of these arrows, 
as does soil traits. And we can break down those traits into physical, chemical, and biological uh, um, uh, realms, the texture, the depth of the soil, the mineralogy of the soil, that is the, uh, how much uh, sand, silt, and clay are in the soil as well. What are, what are those particles made out of? What's the nutrient status of the soil? And then what's the microbial activity like in the soil? Are there a lot of fungi in the soil? Is it mainly bacteria? These are all important things that help determine uh, the overall uh, ability of this carbon that comes into the system to actually stay in the system. When we actually look at measurements of the carbon in and the carbon out, it paints, it paints a fairly bleak picture with respect to the ability for a carbon to actually accumulate in the system. Another messy plot here, we're looking at the carbon balance of the system called net ecosystem exchange here. And this has been measured with um, what's known as eddy flux covariance towers that are actually measuring the carbon concentration above the plant canopy of grass, a cool season grass system, and alfalfa uh, over an entire uh, year. And in fact, it was done over uh, a series of four years here. The take, what I really want you to focus on here is that the upper two lines here that are uh, the circles are showing the grass and alfalfa daytime net ecosystem exchange. So that really is the amount of carbon uptake by the system. Uh, let's call it NPP uh, for, our, for our purposes. Whereas these upside down triangles on the bottom here are the losses via microbial respiration. Okay, so these are monthly averages that are summed from these almost continuous uh, measurements of carbon fluxes. And what I want you to focus on here is that these lines that are squares are the net effect or really uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the gains via NPP and the losses via microbial respiration. These squares are the difference between those two. And so a positive value here indicates that the system is a net ecosystem carbon sink for a particular period of time. And when they go negative, the system is a net ecosystem carbon uh, source to the atmosphere. And what I'm the reason I'm showing you this is that you can see that there really are only two or three points in the year. It's in uh, late spring or early spring, I should say, when the plants are really ripping, when MPP is really happening at a high rate, uh, and yet it's still fairly cool. So the microbes aren't doing uh, as having as much activity as they are later on in the summer when it gets really warm. Uh, the, these are the only periods when the system is a net carbon sink. And so as you can imagine, things that we do in terms of management that reduce the plant's ability to take up carbon during this period uh, have a profound effect on whether or not the system is a carbon sink overall. We looked at the carbon sink source dynamics at the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems trial in a different way. Those last data were showing you uh, real-time measurements of carbon above the plant canopy. Here, we took a different approach where we actually measured soil carbon in these different uh, cropping systems, pastures, forage, and grain crops over a 20-year period. So these are the difference, the change in soil organic carbon on a per hectare basis. Um, from 1989 to 2009. And in this case, it's from 1999 to 2009. So 10-year-old restored prairie uh, and CRP, which are also grasslands, and then 20-year-old cropping systems. And what you see here is that in our grain cropping systems, which are corn, corn and soybean, corn, soybean, and wheat, um, we're losing about five megagrams, or we lost about five megagrams of carbon overall over that 20-year period, which is about 25 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. Likewise, our forage systems, which included alfalfa, we're also losing carbon, about two and a half uh, megagrams of carbon. Our pasture system, which is a cool season grazed pasture, uh, the average was a, a, a positive 2.5, say, but you can see the variation uh, leads us to the conclusion that these systems were holding on to whatever carbon they had in 1989. So they weren't significantly different from zero. So we'd like to say that they were neither losing or gaining carbon, they held on to what they had. Likewise, the prairie systems that we had planted some 10 years previous uh, were holding on to whatever carbon they had on average. We also did this sort of thing more recently in what we call bioenergy cropping systems experiment. And in this bioenergy cropping systems experiment, we were comparing no-till corn maize, no-till corn and soybeans, switchgrass, which is a warm season perennial grass grown as a monoculture, miscanthus, which is a tropical grass grown as a monoculture. Here's a mixture of grasses. Here's poplar trees. Here's a successional field, which is a fancy way of saying a bunch of weeds that we harvested every year, and then prairie. And so what's important is that because it was a bioenergy cro uh, cropping systems trial, uh, we did harvest all of these crops every year in the fall. 
after they produced as much biomass as they could, we removed uh, most of the uh, above ground plant biomass. Now, this is data from 2008, 2013, and 2017, and it's just the surface 10 centimeters. It's just 10 centimeters of soil. The takeaway message here uh, is that uh, no-till maize, switchgrass, miscanthus, and poplar were not significantly changing in those surface 10 centimeters of soil. The no-till maize soybean situation was that we were losing about 18 grams of carbon per meter squared per year, similar to our results at WIXT. On the other hand, our mixture of grasses, our weed community, and our mixture of prairie plants were gaining carbon to the tune of, oh, let's say on average about 30 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. Okay, so harken back to our estimate that we would need 10 to 70 grams of carbon per meter squared per year in order to offset climate change. We're looking pretty good on these grasslands, but there's a rub. And that rub is if we look deeper. So when we look across the entire 80 centimeters of depth, we look down to the, basically to the glacial till, uh, there are, first of all, no differences among our cropping systems. And so we lumped all of our cropping systems. And when we do that, we see an overall trend during this period from 2008 to 2017 of a loss of soil carbon of, uh, to the tune of negative 77 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So all of our cropping systems, when we look across the entire depth of the soil profile, we're losing a significant amount of carbon uh, over this time period. So uh, pretty grim. Uh, the summary of all this is that in the surface soils, our diverse perennial grasslands, uh, after 10 to 20 years, uh, we're either holding on to or gaining carbon, but when we look across the entire soil profile, we're not seeing those kinds of gains. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about so much is that this, these experiments were done at our Arlington Ag Research Station here in Southern Wisconsin. And those soils tend to be very productive and pretty carbon rich to begin with. And so we really need to do these same experiments. And of course, these are happening in other places on less productive, low carbon soils, because maybe those soils have a greater capacity to accumulate. Uh, but it, that's an important finding even if those lower carbon soils can accumulate carbon, then that needs to be accounted for in our overall global accounting. Uh, if, if other places are accumulating carbon like we are in our surface horizons, uh, but at the rates that they are now, that might, you might consider that that's probably too slow to address climate change the way we need to address it. And in fact, this continued carbon loss from deeper soils is a real concern. And, and relating back to the thing about permafrost in the polar regions, it could be that we're seeing a positive feedback from climate change to, you know, which is to say more warming to these deeper soils where we're actually stimulating microbial activity and driving off carbon that otherwise had uh, been buried uh, under prairie systems uh, before uh, European colonization and, and settlement of the area. And so that's one of the things that we're currently exploring. Uh, so the takeaway message here is bleak in terms of our ability to mitigate uh, climate change via uh, agricultural management. But I want to say one thing. The elephant in the room is the combustion of fossil fuels. We can do try all we can to try and reduce carbon uh, in the atmosphere with our current agricultural practices and even some advanced agricultural practices like including grasslands. But until we slow down and or eliminate uh, the combustion of deep, deep carbon that's coming uh, out of the ground as oil and natural gas and, and other types of fossil fuels, it's not likely we're going to be able to mitigate climate change with uh, agricultural management. We do, however, have to adapt to climate change. It is happening and it's going to continue to happen. And so let's talk a little bit more about that as we move on. 